All right, thanks for coming, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, on behalf of the Center for Digital Strategies, we are excited today to welcome Will Collins back to Tuck um, from Drift. So Will, Will has been um, at Drift for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Prior to coming to Tuck, he is a T16. Prior to coming to Tuck, he had a few different roles in venture capital. I'll let him introduce himself more fully. Um, and I guess we met. We yeah. back when in California pr on a preterm trip, mm -hmm. maybe four or five years ago. Um, so, so had a good kind of working relationship with Will over the years, and we're we're really excited for all the work that's happening at Drift with chatbots and AI and what's happening in conversational marketing and conversational commerce, whatever your term of choice is. So, as part of the Brit series, as you know, we're exploring emerging technologies this year for our 10th anniversary year with Brit. Um, and chatbots are squarely in that space, and, and really exciting things going on that Will's going to dive a little bit deeper in. So please join me in giving a warm welcome back to talk to Will Collins. Thank you very much. Um, I will try to be loud for those of you in the back. It's good to be back. Um, yeah, so so the, the, the two seconds of context on me, and then I, I want to jump in right to the content and give you guys what you're hoping for. Um, I did finance and venture before Tuck. I thought long term I wanted to be an operator rather than uh, an investor. And so I landed at Drift. I graduated without a job. So for all of you people, you can do it. Um, <laughs> don't be afraid. Take your time. Find what's right. Um, and I landed at Drift uh, August of 2016 to give you a sense of the pace. Uh, I was the 13th full-time employee there. We are now about 210. And so in about two years, um, things have changed a lot. We have progressed a lot in this area, but um, excited to be here and share a little bit about how we view the world and what we're building and what we're focused on. So um, I'm going to start by just talking about who we are, why we exist. I think that context in the market is just as important as what we're building. So I want to give you that context. Um, this is our mission. We say we're the new, new way for businesses to buy from businesses. Um, you know, it'll be a little bit different if you were selling to a consumer, so we kind of call that out here, but keep this in the back of your mind. This is the mission. This is what we're building long term. Um, for those of you who have followed the live chat market, it largely started as a support tool. Um, you probably have been on Comcast's website 15 years ago. You could chat in and say, hey, I need to change my credit card number, or you overcharged me, or I've got to return my box, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and chat was, it was simply a, a portal. It was a way to talk to somebody one-to-one. -one and, and why companies bought it 10 years ago was, hey, if, if you, uh, you know, instead of having somebody in a call center on one telephone call, you can have somebody in a call center on three chats. It was a simple, like, cost ROI. There was no intelligence. There was no routing. There was no AI. Chatbots didn't exist. But it's been around a long, long time. We're not the first to do it. We don't claim to be, but I think it's an important distinction. Uh, it started as a support tool. And, and what we started to focus on was we said, no, 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 you're missing the boat. This is, this is, messaging should be used to drive revenue. It's actually a sales tool. It's brand building. It should be a way to, to interact with your customers in a more meaningful way. And so that's how we're a little bit different uh, than a lot of people out there. These are some of the brands that we work with today. Um, not all of this is public, but folks you're going to recognize, Peloton, WeWork, Toast, Eventbrite, GE, Okta, Marketo, Slack, Ellie Mae, right? These are probably brands you've interacted with uh, in some form or another, even McKinsey. Um, but the reason we exist, and, and the reason we started this business a few years ago, uh, I'm using the collective we, I wasn't there, but um, we saw this massive shift in buyer behavior. So we use this slide a lot, and we, we share just the penetration of messaging as a whole. Uh, if you look back at the far left uh, in the early 90s, how many people were on AIM? OK, I'm not that, not that old. That's good. Uh, I was as well. You're away message, right? Um, messaging isn't new. It's been around for a long, long time. Uh, and, and those tools, you know, back when you were dialing in on your phone line, probably got to like 50 or 100 million users. We had sort of a second wave of messaging in the early 2000s, Skype, BlackBerry Messenger. How many people use BlackBerry Messenger? OK, yeah, a lot of us, right? I probably got to 200, 300 million users. If you look at 2010 on that group of providers, Facebook, WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, they go from about zero to a billion users in under five years. 
And so what we looked at in, in 2014 was, okay, that's less time than most companies have to replace their CRM, let alone figure out how to deal with a new channel. Yet this is what our buyers are signaling, how they want to interact, how they want to behave. And, and we saw this paradigm shift happening and we wanted to, to work with companies you know, to deal with it. Uh, another thing that's happening is, is the power is shifting from, uh, sorry, from sellers to buyers, that's backwards. Uh, and what I mean by that is, like, why did Amazon beat Borders? Why did Netflix beat Blockbuster? Yes, they had some technology in the background, but they offered a better experience, right? They were able to capture demand. N the movies on Netflix are no different than the movies that were at Blockbuster, right? It's a more convenient way for you to ingest. Um, the books on Amazon are no different than the books you got in the store in Blockbuster, right? Why do Airbnb beat hotels? Uh, actually, even... Most of Airbnb's inventory already existed before Airbnb did. It's because they were able to capture demand, provide a better user experience on the front end, uh, and it was a buyer-focused experience, right? Same thing with Uber, why they beat cabs. Who loves to take a cab in Boston? It's miserable. Uh, you get yelled at if you don't pay cash, they go the wrong way, it's like you're riding in a jet, uh, not, not a fun experience. Oh, and by the way, here's what the marketing and sales landscape looks like. If you think there isn't a replacement to your tool today, I would love to argue with you. Um, this is what it looks like. Thousands of companies. Five, six years ago, this slide was maybe 50 people. And so the point being, user experience, buying experience, they all matter. And if you're not providing that kind of experience, your customer is going to go somewhere else, right? And, and at the same time, a lot of the tools that you see in that last side are actually focused on a company problem, not a customer problem. They're focused on, you know, like Salesforce. Everybody knows Salesforce. It's a database. It's used so a company can project their revenue. It, it provides absolutely no value to a customer, right? And, and we're all used to this at the same time, right? Like, look at Amazon. One click. This is what you're used to in your, in your consumer life. Um, go to a business. So this is best in class in the consumer world. This is what B2B looks like. You go to a website, they ask you to fill out a form, you become a lead in their CRM, you get like 50 nurturing emails. Uh, then someone decides you're qualified. Maybe you came to the website, maybe you opened six emails, maybe they finally looked at those emails and said, hey, this person is actually somebody that's a good fit for us. Then someone called you, then maybe you talked to somebody, right? Um, this, uh, I've got a, a, a good story. I tried to buy Salesforce, a uh, hundred billion dollar SaaS company today, the largest out there. It took me a month to do it. I showed up credit card in hand, $50,000 ready to buy. I've implemented it a few times, filled out the form twice. No one got back to me. I actually had to chat in. They routed me to someone in Toronto. Toronto said, I'm not your rep. I'm going to push you to New York. I got to New York and then they wanted to have a qualifying call. Then they wanted to have a technical call. Then I bought a month, $50,000. Right? That's crazy. And we spent about $45 billion in B2B just to get people to a form. Um, the best analogy I have for this, uh, I'm going to come back to that, is this. So imagine you are in Boston on Boylston Street, whether you're Microsoft or Apple, you just spent like $10 million building a store. You've got all your products in there. They look pretty. There's descriptions. People can come in and try them. And literally no one is in there. There's no cash register. There's no people to help you. That is the equivalent of what we do in B2B today. This is what we expect though, right? We walk into Apple, somebody helps us. Oh, you're looking for a watch, come over here. Can I help you buy that? Let me show you how to use the product. Let me sell you to the new MacBook Pro. Let me teach you a course on how to use your iMac, right? That's the experience we all know and love, but this is the experience we're getting. And so we spend about $45 billion to get people to our forms in B2B. Average conversion rate's 0.7% which means that 99% of that traffic that we just paid for is wasted, right? Out of 100 people that walked in, 99 walked out of your, your store, right? And so that's the problem ultimately that we're trying to solve at Drift, and, and we tested this. So this is, th these are results from uh, a study we ran using Mechanical Turk. Uh, we became leads in about 1,000 B2B company funnels, so we had people go out and fill out these forms, and we timed how fast people got back to us. And literally 9% were able to get back to us within an hour. 27% within a day, 55% never even got back to us, which is pretty insane, right? Uh, these are 
companies that are paying lots of money to get impressions, to get you know, your, your thought, your time, to get you into their store, and they won't even respond when you choose to engage, right? Um, I use this because this is neutral third-party research. Um, this is a company called Databox. They actually benchmark a lot of our customers and look at what the response rates are uh, using chatbots. You can see about 59% talk to 10% or more of the people that walk into their store, right? Whereas the average for a forum is one. You know, a, a 10x increase is, is pretty meaningful. We as a company, so we run at Drift, uh, we call them chat duty shifts. We all have a couple hours a week now. Uh, we probably talk to 25% of the people that come to our website. Uh, that could be current customers, new customers, anonymous visitors, whatever the case may be. Uh, meaningful difference than the 1% that you see from, from most people out there, right? The reason this has not happened in the past is that scaling this is really, really hard, right? Um, scaling conversations is hard. Um, how many people have called their bank recently? Anyone? Okay. I just did the other day. It was terrible. Uh, this is how I felt. Um, IVR was supposed to kind of do this, you know, when you call your bank and they're like, okay, what's your account number? You type it in. Like they do a couple things where you can get your bank balance or whatever, but if you actually want to talk to somebody, then you have to repeat your account number again and again and again, and then they transfer you and again, and it's miserable the whole time, and none of that actually flows through in a conversation, right? Um, and they're probably understaffed, so you're waiting like 15, 20 minutes to get to somebody, right? Because it's a cost for their business and they're trying to reduce it every year. Um, oh, and by the way, you know, this is probably what, you know, in B2B, like lots of our calendars look like. We don't have time to sit there all day and just respond to people, right? We've got meetings, we've got, I don't know, visits, we've got uh, recruiting to do, we've got interviews, we've got demos. You know, it's hard to get people to sit on the back end, especially in a B2B company, and field all these questions. That's why people have been pretty slow to adopt historically. So what we do at Drift, so we use conversation, conversations in AI to engage with customers. You can see that 24-7, 365, in real time, when they're on our site, when they're in tent, when they walk into our store. Um, and, and the results are real. We're, we're using it to drive revenue. So th this is just, I'm going to get into bots and AI in a little bit more depth here, but this is how people talk about it and, and, and how we're specifically focused on revenue. These are like random tweets. So that company, in the, uh, that tweet in the top left, that's um, the CMO at a company called Rapid Miner in Boston. They're probably 120 people. Chat is now their number one source of leads. Um, in the middle, you can see like millions of dollars. Every time you log into our platform, you're gonna see how many conversations, how many sales leads, how much revenue are we driving for you. Um, on the right, this is a company called Ipswich. I think we generated about $2 million worth of pipeline for them in a couple months. So more conversations, talking to your customers, talking to those people that walk into your store means more revenue. And that's the line that we're trying to drive. But, um, and we do it with bots. So bots can do three things well, or I'm going to talk about three things. So the first thing is complete tasks for you. Um, and you guys are probably all used to this kind of view, right? Um, I have two Alexas. I'm sure you all have at least one or have interacted with one before. You want it to play your favorite music, right? You want to order pizza from Domino's. You want to turn on your lights at your home. You want to request an Uber. You want to find a local business, whatever the case may be. It's very good at you telling it to do something, and it will go out and do it, right? It's convenient. It saves you time. Um, how do we do something similar? So you probably land on one of our sites, or you go to drift.com. You'll see this happen. Um, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the background, and I can talk about that. but. There's probably some message that pops up, hey, welcome, can we help you, what are you looking for? Um, maybe a bot pops up and asks you, what company are you with? Oh, what's your role? Are you looking for X, Y, or Z? Um, and then if you're like the right fit and you're looking for a salesperson, for example, we'll even go into you know, the calendar of one of our sales reps and say, oh, this person is open at these three times, do you want to book a meeting right, right away? Um, a, a similar analogy to this would be like you, you want to book an appointment at the Apple Genius Bar, right? 
You don't want to just show up and wait in line or whatever the case may be. You want to get to an answer and book a meeting quickly. Um, so this is an example of our bot that has enough intelligence to you know, figure out who you are, look in our system, see if you exist. If you already do, it's going to know who you are and probably route you to the right person. But if it doesn't, it'll ask a couple of qu clarifying questions and figure out who the right person is for you to meet. That could be in sales. That could be in customer support. That could be um, you know, based on where you're coming from in the site or some of the keywords that you're using, whatever the case may be. It's got an intelligence layer to help you complete that task. right? And this is predominantly, when we look out at chatbots and AI, what most, what most people are doing today. Um, it's interesting. It's helpful. It's convenient. It's more difficult than you would think, but it's not that hard. Um, but we all love it because it's getting something done for us in real time, and it's, and it's quick. Um, and you get some pretty funny messages, actually. Uh, from customers, like even so, this is this is somebody that um, part of our capability is for us to tell if we're reaching out to you in multiple channels, we can marry those and say, um, "Oh, Jeff is actually the one reaching out to you. He's your account rep. Oh, he's already emailed you. We should like fire a personalized message that says, I know we're talking over email, but if you want to book a meeting, like I'm here available. Go ahead and do it.'" Um, and this was this is uh, somebody from Glassdoor, actually that that company. If you use them, um, she's her mind's blown just because she all the context is there. She's quickly routed to to the right person. Um, she can book a meeting in real time without interacting with anybody, and she's in and out within 20 seconds of what she was trying to accomplish. Right. So I I bleeped out some of the expletives. Uh, that's an example. Um, another thing that chatbots do today um, that I think is like evolution number two is, is find an answer, an answer for you. Um, by the way, if people have questions while I'm going, interrupt, please. Um, so here's Siri. Uh, what song is playing right now? We've probably all done this at some point. Um, and Siri knows, OK. It's got to go find Shazam. It's got to figure out. It's got to like pass your data to Shazam and say, uh, "What song is this?" It's got to send data back, and pretty quickly it finds you know it finds you an answer. It helps you navigate to an answer. It finds you the content you're looking you're looking for, um, or whatever the case may be. We we have a similar product. So what we do at Drift is think about your website as. Um, a whole trove of, of content, right? Um, and if you've spent any time in B2B websites, they're not that intuitive. Um, it's not like you go there and you just search for one product, you know what you're looking for, and you transact, right? You're probably going there to learn about the company, learn about the product, learn about a specific integration, does it fit into your company or not, et cetera. And it can be pretty daunting to find your way around. And so, Part of what the bot will do, and we call these skills, similar to like a, an Amazon would, uh, if you write in and say, how do playbooks work? Instead of waiting for somebody on our support team to come in and say, oh, they work this way, and here's what you got to do, and point you to a help doc, or whatever the case may be, the bot has actually ingested all the content of our website and uses like fuzzy matching logic to ingest what you've asked and find what the most relevant articles are for you. And here's an example of, of where it sent four. Um, and you know, frankly, once we send four, like 90 plus percent of the time, the person says, great, this is really helpful. I got my answer. I can move on. Um, and, and they've got their answer. Either they've navigated to the right place, they've got the right content, um, or you know, if, if we don't, they can say, oh, no, this doesn't really work, and we'll route it to a human to, to actually intervene in that case. So automating, whether it's a navigation issue or a content issue or getting you an answer, pretty, you know, it's more difficult than task-based, um, but still you know, not, not, not too bad. And the third and the hardest in where the world is going, uh, I think this will be useful for, for everybody to know, um, is to automate the whole conversation, right? And not have buttons and not have specific tasks and be able to ingest what you've said in an intelligent way 
and, and figure out what your intent is, what the entities of the conversation are, how you want to be responded to, what, what kind of response you're looking for, and actually have multiple questions, multiple asks, multiple um, interactions with you in a single conversation, and know when it's over intelligently, right? Um, anyone seen this movie? Yeah, it wasn't bad, a little weird. Uh, the, the premise is he, uh, this is Joaquin Phoenix, right? Uh, he falls in love with Siri, basically, because Siri is like this personality in his ear, and she can interact with him all day, all night, and becomes his best friend, and it's a little weird. But um, that's like the holy grail of, of AI and chatbots, the ability to have multiple interactions, have a full thread, know when a conversation is you know, uh, going well, not going well, and, and how to finish it. Um, so this is an example. Someone will come to one of our pages uh, and say, like, what's the price of your standard plan? Very simple question. Um, and how the model works, just so you guys have a sense, is it, it has to go through like these five things, keywords. Um, what are the keywords in the sentence? It has to identify those, like what's the filler language, what isn't, and why. It has to do fuzzy matching. We are all very bad typers, very bad. <laughs> And you're going to miss a keystroke. You're going to use slang. You're going to forget a question mark. You're going to um, you know, miss a space or whatever the case may be. It's got to use a bunch of matching logic to actually parse out what the words are that you're using in the event it doesn't know. Uh, it's got to figure out your intent. What kind of output are you looking for? Um, do you want an article? Do you want a response? Do you want a number? Do you want a price? Do you want like whatever the case that may be? Um, entities. It's got to figure out who is you, who is me, who is we, who is he, who is she, right? All of that. That can be confusing. And then dialogues is just a fancy way of saying like all of these things fit together in one way and they have to be in a certain order. And um, you've got to be able to, like, if I wrote back to that $50 plan um, you standard or something, you'd be like, okay, this doesn't make much sense. You'd maybe piece it together, but it would be confusing. So it's got to run all these micro little tasks to figure out where things fit together. Um, and so that's what happens. And so it identifies. Price, OK, that's important. Standard uh, plan is, is like an entity that you're looking for. Standard is the type of plan that you're looking for. It's a question. You're, you're expecting a response there. And then the order of all these words. And effectively, what ends up happening is these models, um, and I am not a machine learning expert uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I've been involved in some of these. Effectively, what they do is they build these really, 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 really big trees, decision trees. Um, and each of these have weights, and they decide based on what you've said where you should go down the tree. Um, and they are more dynamic than this, but this is an example. Um, you can read it. It's kind of weird. I Googled it. Uh, but the point is it's a tree. It's a decision tree. And at each point, there's, um, you know, Probably for that given sentence in and of itself, like there could be hundreds of these happening at the same time, trying to figure out um, you know, standard and plan, what does that mean, the price, trying to figure out where the words go together, trying to figure out um, you know, what, how, how to respond. All of those things are kind of happening in parallel in the background. And it'll come up with like a few options. And I just use these confidence intervals to keep it simple, but you know, the price of our standard plan is $50, maybe it's option A, and option B says, you know, the price of our, our pro plan is $500. And maybe in option A, with only a little bit of data, they're like, okay, I'm 49% confident that that's the right answer. And in option B, they're like, well, I'm 51% confident that's the right answer. And in this case, it's going to be horribly wrong, right? It's going to pick option B and say, I'm the most confident in that, and I think that that's going to be uh, the right response. And at the bottom of the conversation, you're going to click that. <laughs> um, usually you'll see, especially when it comes to chatbots on any of these sites, some sort of customer satisfaction sort of rating at the end of it. Um, they're asking you to indicate, did it work or did it not work? Um, and there is still, 
Yeah, I mean, we've even used IBM Watson. Like, there is still a human element into all of these things. And frankly, gathering data is, is a really critical component of this. So when you click this, you're helping train the model. You're helping go back into their archive of data and say, this was wrong. We shouldn't have been this confident. We should not have picked this response. And then they'll go back and actually, if the model is smart, it will actually learn why. Um, so if that same question came a second time, and, or maybe let's say you've had 5 million of these, right? You get pretty good at figuring out after 5 million times what the right response is to something like this. And, and maybe in the future it says, OK, I'm 90% confident that option A is the right one and only 80% confident in B. And over time, given enough responses and given enough training and enough sample data, um, it gets pretty good. Now, it probably wouldn't be 90 to 80. It'd be like 90 to 2, but you get the point. And then it's going to choose option A, and you're going to say, yep, got it. That was perfect, right? More feedback for the model. Yep, that was right. Just like the regression analyses you guys all do in, in, um, in stats, right? Like you run one model, you figure it out, like the p-value, t-stats, all that kind of stuff. Yes, I still have PTSD. Um, <laughs> but then you run it again. OK, I got a little bit better. My adjusted R square went up. It, you know, what this does in real time in the background is it's is it built to make those adjustments on the fly. And so that's the model that powers it. Um, and this is what it looks like from a process perspective. So usually you start with a bunch of raw data, a bunch of conversations. Um, and the hard part about chatbots in particular is the, the basically they're, they're exponentially difficult because every word that you add is another part of an interaction. And so each sentence has 10 words, but then there's 10 sentences, and then there's paragraphs, and then there's start and stop. And so they become really, really hairy models. But basically, you add in raw data. You come up with like your first confidence intervals. Then you start to uh, introduce new data to the set and continue to test. And then you get feedback. You deploy it. You continue to get feedback. And you just circle back and back and back and back and back. And as you can imagine, over time, you get much, much better at it, right? Um, so this is how many messages go over our platform today, about 10 million messages per day. And so most of what you'll see from our bots uh, at this point on, on uh, our pages, if you go to drift.com or you go to a customer that's using us, you usually see like Powered by Drift in the bottom right so you can tell it's us. Um, most what, what we've spent most of our time doing is keeping you to a track for the most part. We don't want you to get too far off the track. Maybe that's with buttons. Like, you know, when we ask you a question, we'll give you four buttons. You, cho you choose one. Um, maybe that's pre-canned responses. Um, or we know enough or we've had enough conversations to say, um, OK, if you respond with some of these words, like, I know enough to, to keep you going down the track. Or I know the context of the page well enough to guide you down. Um, but this is what's informing our models every day. And more and more, what, what you'll see us do and what we've already been doing is transitioning off of those guardrails onto something like this. And so every single day, we've got 10 million more data points coming into this. This worked. This didn't work, um, et cetera. And, and nowadays, as you think about live chat uh, and where it's going, roughly 90% of all of our conversations are you know, involve some kind of bot. That could be a bot comes in in the middle of a conversation to do a task because that makes the most sense in that case. That could be because um, you know, it started the conversation because we weren't around at a given time. Uh, you know, it's midnight, and somebody from you know, Europe chatted in and wanted an answer to something. Or a prospect came in and wanted to book a meeting now, and we you know, just weren't there for whatever reason. So, about 90% of conversations. There's still a small percentage where it's just going to be human to human, one to one. Um, and again, hard to scale, but that still does exist. And actually, about 30% of our conversations are handled solely by the bot. So this number we've seen as high as 40 to 50% uh, in some scenarios. And we'll get better as we transition from you know, guardrails to that sort of more automated conversation. Um, but these are the numbers we tracked. How uh, that we track? How often is a bot involved? How how many times can we get you to an answer and a positive interaction without anybody being involved? Right? 
Um, and that number is about 30% today. It fluctuates. But I'd say that's the state of the market probably as a whole. If you look at Amazon, half the time you ask it something, and it's still like, I don't know what to do, right? It's training. And they have, I mean, forget 10 million messages a day. I can only imagine how many they have. Um, but I think that's par for the course. Very good at automating tasks, very good at helping you find an answer. It can be super convenient for buyers, customers, prospects, et cetera. But we still have a ways to go. And these models are still in their infancy. And it, it is always fascinating to me. There are only a, not, not necessarily a handful, but a small number of people in this world that can build these models and have these libraries and have built out this kind of capability because it's pretty difficult. Um, and we have things go wrong. Anyone know who this is? Yeah, who is it? At Microsoft attempt at a chatbot. Yeah, uh, it was a disaster. <laughs> so, and I love Microsoft, but basically what they were trying to do was get a bot on Twitter to interact with people and it became like racist in like 20 minutes. Like, it was bad. Um, so it makes me feel better that we're, we haven't solved the problem, neither have they. Um, you know, it's, you know, think, look, at, look at slang, see you soon, right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging problem and not everybody has figured it out yet. I would say the other interesting piece of, of chatbots is because everything is actually in text, it gives you a lot more capability than voice. And so what Amazon and Google are trying to do, and that's actually my next slide, I think. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard this or watched it. Um, has anyone seen this demonstration? OK. It's like a minute. Should I play it? OK. This is hard. Um, but it'll give you a sense of some of the I'll have something out for you. Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking That's for something bot. on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So voice is a whole nother um, a whole nother challenge. But Google is probably the closest on that front. I, I would assume Amazon is, is not too far behind. Um, the reason you're seeing chatbots more, the reason you will probably continue to see them more is because text is more controllable. The input is more controllable. Uh, building it into a model, the data already exists in the same form that you're going to be analyzing it, all of that. And, and let's face it, like Patrick and I were talking about this today, a lot of companies are still trying to get into the cloud, right? Let alone like figure out some of this stuff. And so I think voice will be kind of the next frontier for 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 bots and the like. Um, but as far as today is concerned, I think you're going to see more and more chatbots. You're going to be interacting with them more. They're going to be there to serve as your concierge to a brand to get an answer, to to find what you're looking for. And slowly over time, we're going to continue to see this proliferation into they're going to actually handle the whole conversation. And they're going to have multiple interactions with you in the same sitting. And they're going to be following up with you. Um, one of the things that we've been baking in in the back end in our product as well is, OK, after this conversation, what next? Right? You left, but you probably expected something. Maybe you got an answer there. Maybe you booked a meeting with somebody. Maybe we should follow up beforehand and make sure you get that email that we have a meeting in an hour. Or we should follow up with a personalized email from a sales rep and say, I'm really excited. Here's what I know about your company. Here are a couple of quick questions just to make sure I'm prepared. Those are the kinds of things that we've already built into the product and we're continuing to, to think through. Um, but still, still a long way to go. So quickly, what are the challenges? Um, 
we, get, we have to build our libraries. Like, we have to know what price means. We have to know what standard means. We have to build these really, really big libraries on the back end that classify words. We're still building those. Um, tracking and piping data. This is, you know, the infrastructure and the demand from a data perspective is real here. And a lot of systems, even like Amazon Web Services is amazing, but when you start to talk about Facebook ingesting every single post, I mean, those are billions and billions and billions of, of lines of text that have to be analyzed and coded and interpreted. Um, still something that we're working on from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, failing gracefully, that's a big one. If we're gonna put this out, and, and this is something that we, we work with customers all the time, if we're gonna put a bot out on your site, how do we make sure it's the right experience for your customer? How do we make sure if something goes wrong, the bot sort of politely steps aside and a human can intervene so that it's not a bad interaction? That's actually the number one pushback we get from brands. What if something goes wrong? What if you don't have the perfect model? Um, we have some fail safes built in our product. A lot of people do. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Let me get get somebody for you. That's that's an ongoing challenge. Um, model training. You need more data. You got to continue be. You got to continually be um, fixing your confidence intervals and how the model works and how it ingests data and 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 what it spits out and then visibility. Because some of these models are like a black box uh, on the back end, <coughs> how do we know why it chose something? I think we've got a long way to go uh, on the machine learning side in terms of, okay, we chose this for these couple reasons, or these are the main reasons we chose it. And then when we go to debug, we actually have a very good sense of what we're fixing and why we're fixing it. Because um, some of these models, neural networks, K nearest neighbors, anyone taken Powell's data mining class? Yeah, right? Uh, sometimes you put in data and you get out something and you have no idea why. Uh, that's really hard for a business, um, <laughs> especially if you're going to be trusting your brand with, with, with one of these bots. And so something that everybody in the industry, when you go to a conference or you talk about AI or machine learning or whatever the case may be, is struggling with how do we give people the visibility into seeing when something works and why and when something goes wrong, also why and how do we fix it. So. That's where we're spending a lot of our cycles today. Um, my final thought, and then I hope people have questions because it's been a lot of me talking. Um, so this is Molly Graham. Molly Graham's an advisor to us. She was a very early investor at Facebook. Um, and I am no machine learning or AI expert, but I think this is fitting, which is, she basically said you can learn anything if you're willing to sound like a, comp a complete moron. Um, ask the dumb questions. Don't be afraid if you're not you know, super well versed in you know, whatever the back end technical piece is. Um, you can figure out chatbots, they're not that complicated. You can figure out AI or machine learning. You may not be the person you know, with a PhD in statistics building the model, but you can still interact with it and leverage it. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. So can you talk a little bit about the companies that are a good fit for, for, for this type of application yeah. and technology versus the companies that aren't and sort of where, what does that dividing line look like? Yeah, honestly, the, the, the biggest, I, I think everybody is a fit. Um, we have chosen to focus on B2B customers first because the experience is so bad, right? Amazon's pretty good. You go, you can buy something relatively quickly. They still put it in there check out as well, LinkedIn does. There's a bunch of consumer brands that do as well. Um, but we chose B2B because, you know, like for some of these companies, if they book a single meeting, it can be worth millions of dollars. And by the way, like best in class is a form. Actually, best in class is like a form two places. So the bar is just so low and they've got a lot of traffic. Like they have a lot of high value traffic, they're paying for traffic, they want people to come into their site to learn more about their brand and they've never invested in brand. And so giving them the ability to have these conversations and have them at scale means almost immediate ROI. Um, and an ROI on a tool like this can be thousands of times really, really fast versus if you're trying to you know, work in a, in a shopping cart basket where you're gonna get somebody to spend five more dollars thousands of times, it's just a longer, a longer tail. And the volume will be higher in B2C. So we do have you know, Peloton, um, 
here's an example. We do have higher, uh, we say ASP, but priced goods that are uh, on the consumer spectrum that use us, but that's why we've prioritized. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, one of the important concerns about chatbots and messaging is the information security and risk. Mm -hmm. So what kind of courses are you seeing, legal or otherwise, for encryption yeah. and data security? Because WhatsApp came up with end-to-end -end encryption, and yeah. one of the major, see chatbots and messaging is one of the major concerns. So yeah. what are your thoughts on that? So um, if you are going to be a player of volume in the space today, you have to be encrypted all the way in transit to at rest. So like our company is anything you send from one place to another is encrypted and anything that's stored in any of our databases has to be encrypted. And so that part of that is like if you're a big enough company and serving some of the brands that we do, like Fortune 500 companies, they, they can't have their conversations with their customers leaked. Um, and so that's kind of a security requirement. On the other hand, from an information security perspective, we talk a lot about GDPR in Europe and, and beyond, right? Um, and that is, we are technically capturing your email address, your IP address, we're looking up what company you're coming from before you, we've even talked to you. And we need to get consent for that, so actually we've built in our product a way to do that. So you have to opt in and say, yes, I want to have this conversation, I want to give you this information, you do have the right to store this transcript as I interact with you, and we have to enable our customers to do the same thing. Now, on the other hand, um, if you looked at the different channels, email, voice, chat, um, chat is by far the highest in terms of customer satisfaction. It has like a 72% CSAT rate versus voice is like 20. So it's, it's how people want to communicate. It, they want to do it asynchronously. They want to do it on their time. And it's a lot more convenient than hanging on the phone. So it's a balance, right? We want to make it easy for people to interact, but we also have to make sure we're clear on what data we're tracking and storing and why. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Vishal. I used to work in B2B sales before yeah. coming to Tuck. So uh, one of the good things, one of uh, the uh, characteristics of a good salesman was finding information of the uh, customer mm -hmm. and empathize with the customer. So I'm curious to know, do you see uh, this problem of empathy with chatbots? And if yes, how are you solving that problem? Yeah, I, it's, it's a debate we have a lot, which is like, where should a chatbot be involved and where shouldn't it? Um, I think it's, and, and historically how we've sort of settled that debate is it should be additive to the experience, experience. it shouldn't detract from the customer experience. So in the event, um, you saw Lauren from, from Glassdoor on there uh, writing in, um, she wanted to talk to somebody, she, and that was her rep, and she wanted to talk to him. And the fact that we had done all the work on the back end to figure out who that was and actually routed her directly to him was a very good thing. Um, and that's not necessarily a bot doing it, it's some automation on the back end. But when in doubt, when there's a meaningful discussion to have, like we would much rather have that be human to human. But if you want to accomplish something quickly, you want to get information or an answer quickly, um, we optimize it for the experience. And so there will be cases where we shouldn't have had a bot in there. And actually in our product, you can set different playbooks for different pages based on who's coming where and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's to solve that exact problem. We don't want a bot in every single conversation. Um, what we care about is the intent and is the customer getting to their answer quickly. Um, and that's what we try to optimize for. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about how you offer sort of personalized products on a per customer basis? If I'm McKinsey, the tone of my chatbot is going to be completely different yeah. than if I'm like Grubhub, where their website is a little bit snarky, a little bit yeah, fun. Yeah, absolutely. How do you work through that with so, such a wide variety of clients? Yeah, so it's going to, so basically the way our platform is built, um, like you turn on the widget and then there's a bunch of stuff that has to happen on the back end. Uh, what do you do with anonymous visitors? What do you do with known visitors? Um, what messaging do you put on what pages? When do you want the widget to show up? When do you not want it to show up? And that's really where the hard work is done. And so somebody like a McKinsey might say, okay, I only want to talk to Fortune 500 brands that come to my site and are on this specific page, and I want to tailor a specific response on that page. Maybe it's a white paper on chatbots, right? They're saying, hey, are you interested in this? We have a partner that specializes in X, Y, or Z. They can customize all that. And so 
that's the, that's the key to it. It has to be hyper contextual and it has to be on brand and we give them the ability to set all of those parameters. And what we do on our end from a company perspective is we have a team of customer success managers that literally make it custom. The logo, the look and feel, when it shows up, who's on the back end, who gets routed, who doesn't, what playbook shows up on what page. It's all customized depending on your needs. And so that's like really the flexibility. Yeah. Um, does Dirt currently only operate in the English? We don't. Um, international, we, I, I think we have 15 languages. Um, Google. Sort of complexity are you saying adding more languages and what is the demand there? Yeah, there is a fair amount of demand. I mean, if you looked at messaging as a whole, it's actually more popular overseas even than it is in the U.S. Um, we, we have about 15 languages. There are some open source like translation tools through Google, for example, that we use um, that we can automatically port in. So on one hand, you can be English, and on the other end, you could be a bunch of different languages. Um, so we do have that ability. Now, the challenge we have with it is you know, so, like sometimes the tone is super formal, and it's awkward. And people are like, why are you using this terminology when it makes no sense when I'm having like, a friendly conversation? Um, so we definitely deal with that. It's, it's one of the few tools that has the ability to go in that many languages, but um, hasn't been a core focus for us. But about you know, 30 to 40% of our customers are international. Um, and probably half of those are English speaking and the other half aren't. So we definitely deal with it day to day. Yeah? Um, is there any way to move away from the decision tree? Like, is it just have to be yeah. a, a, a set of... That's the, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's more to explain than it is to be um, perfectly instructive. Like, we have a bunch of different models. A tree is one of them. There's KG classifiers. There's, like, neural networks. There, we run, actually, multiple uh, models on the same data, and we track who gets the best response over time and why. Um, like yeah, absolutely. Questions, you group it all in That's what I mean by libraries. Okay. Um, you start with words, and then they become phrases, and then they become sentences, and and you can actually relate to how close they are to one another, yeah. and that can inform the model as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. First, uh, the data that you use, like um, you only use data from each customer, for example, you are offering a chatbot for McKinsey and another one for, I don't know, another company. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mix the data from one another? No. It's, it's, it's all, even down to the database level, segregated into okay. their own. And the second question is, do you offer your clients some kind of interface for them to understand their clients? Because by interacting with the chatbot, mm -hmm. definitely you have some pretty <coughs> important data about their clients. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say we've done less on the like survey NPS side of the world, but we will we give them when you log into our dashboard. The first thing you see how many conversations you're having, how that's trending over time, how many meetings you've booked, how many qualified leads you've captured. Because we are more focused on revenue than we are support, um, so that is definitely there. Then you also see here's how much pipeline we've generated, here's how much business we've closed, etc. Um, and if you want to dig a layer deeper, you can see, okay, my traffic is coming in at this time of the day. Here are the countries it's coming from. Here are the typical questions that are being asked. Asked. Here's how fast I am to respond to them. Here's who's responding to them. And we'll drive specific insights as well as to what's coming up versus what isn't. We're not as detailed as like a company like a Clara Bridge that's going to ingest all the text in your company and say like, Red Roof Inn has thin walls relative to Marriott, and I can tell that by all the tweets out in the world. But we do give insights in the platform themselves. Exactly, okay. yeah. And then whenever you write in as a company, we've automatically like enriched with a bunch of different data sources to figure out who you are, where you're coming from, uh, if we know who you are already, like what kind of company it is, what industry you're in, how big you are, how many employees, all that, what your tech stack looks like, all that context so that you can have a meaningful conversation quickly. Yeah. Can you talk about your lead qualifying process? Because I can imagine as a salesperson, yeah. if you're just allowing like the Wild West to book time in your calendar, yeah. that can be pretty yeah. challenging. Um, so it can be set by admins. Um, we usually default to like a CRM to look at who owns an account first. And we do some matching there that's 
unique. And then um, either a company can set their own criteria. So I only want uh, B2B software companies that are over 200 employees that are in the US that whatever. And in some cases, we can only show the widget to those people as well. And we can pull in like, hey, um, I see you're coming from this company and you're using this technology. Have you thought about using Drift or something? Right? We can do that sort of level of personalization. Um, but the company can set what they want to be able to, we call it a goal. Like when something happens, you want to be able to book or you want to you know, push them to a, maybe it's a BDR or whatever the case may be. You can do that routing sort of as you wish. And we plug into other scores as well. Uh, Mad Kudu is a company that does like machine learning lead scoring that plugs into our platform. For example, yeah. Uh, so it seems like the chatbot industry is pretty nascent, mm -hmm. generally. Um, like, what's the biggest obstacle to like hitting that inflection point where you get closer to full automation? Is it more on the data side mm -hmm. and getting more responses, or is it more on the programming side on the back end? It's probably a combination of both. Um, and, and every company is going to require some of their own context. So it's, it's probably both. It's the infrastructure, um, building the models, tuning them, writing the code to make sure they retune themselves. That's, that's a lot of work. It's a full-fledged product on the back end. And two, you need enough data. Um, think of how many variations of a conversation there could be, um, billions. And so you, you really need a lot of data to have um, and libraries mapped to really feel confident in the outcome. Um, I think the, you know, candidly, I think the adoption rate of chatbots has a lot less to do with that than it does of the consumer experience. Like, when I go to a site now, we have, we have people tweet at us or tell us this all the time, like when I don't see that in the bottom right hand corner, I'm worried. Because I know if I have to fill out a form or get in touch with a company, it's never gonna happen. And so I think what, what we see as the primary driver short term are actually companies trying to be more customer centric. They're trying to give a brand experience that, they, that they're proud of. And they want people to be able to interact with them. And they know if they don't do that, that, that customer is going to go somewhere else. So that, that's more of the driver. And the chatbots um, tends to be the reflection of, OK, now I've got all these people that want to have conversations. How do I do this in, a, in an efficient way and in the right way? So um, a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that this is like a um, why do you think it is that a lot of the companies that already have established consumer chatbots don't move into this space? I feel like it's pretty customizable. Yeah. Like, it, I don't see like a stark difference between the two. Yeah. So why do you think it is that Drift does have? Yeah. It's um. So I'd be curious as, if someone's popping to your mind on the consumer side that does it really well. Like, there's certainly WhatsApp. There's messaging companies, right? That have sort of the infrastructure layer in between. Um, Facebook sort of has a messenger bot, but it tends to be more ad-driven than anything else. It's, it's not so much to like have a conversation. Um, so, and, and we know those guys very well. Um, so I think it's possible. It's definitely possible. The hard part about B2B is all of the routing that has to happen on the back end. Um, you have to, like there isn't a, usually a checkout on a B2B site. If you don't get an answer, you don't get an answer. In consumer, if you don't get an answer, like you probably go to a, a review, or you ask a friend or something like that. In B two B, like the drop is just much much larger, and you have, you know, like at Drift, for example, we have sixty salespeople. How do I know which one to send it to? How do I know that everybody's getting their fair share? How do I know if someone's already talking to somebody in another channel, they're getting routed into that conversation? Those kind of challenges don't exist in B two C. And so the use case is, is different. Um, and you have to integrate with Salesforce and Marketo and Pardot and Eloqua and all these other tools to really work for a company. Uh, whereas, you know, if, if you're a B2C company, like, it's probably just a volume thing. Like, I just need a person. And it doesn't matter who on the back end is to respond to these things or a chatbot. Uh, so it's a slightly different use case. And I think there are uh, very different needs from a company perspective. Yeah. Technology is evolved. Do you think that there's a possibility that chatbots become a commodity in 10 years from now? Yeah. I, well, I think they're going to be, um, maybe not 10 years, I think they're going to become like a level playing field. I think they'll become par for the course. If you don't have one, 
you will be sacrificing your user experience. And so I think the, the motivation for a company to have one is very, very high. And, um, and it's also something, you know, as you think about call centers or the experience and how you're inter interacting with people that has never really been figured out, not in a good way. Um, even calling a call center today I mean, outside of Zappos, why does Zappos exist? Like that was their whole thing. They were good at customer success. That was it. And now they're a multi-billion dollar company, right? Um, so plenty of companies will struggle with it. And I think for people who want to compete and be brand centric and customer first, they're going to have to have something like it. So that's really going to be um, the, the, the commoditization of it. Um, how you solve the problem, what model is the most accurate, you know, how it plugs into other sources. I think that's going to take longer to figure out. Yeah. Do you always identify when someone's interacting with a bot versus in interacting with an individual? Yeah. And do you find on the data input side, when people know they're interacting with a bot versus an individual, do the actual, actual inputs change? So we always do, and it's, it's guidance we give our customers as well. If you have a bot, it should be a bot. Um, there are companies that send out automated emails that don't tell you it's bot. There are companies that will have chatbots that they don't indicate. We found people want to know, um, and they appreciate when they do know. And actually, from a satisfaction perspective, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, in fact, if they're getting their answer, that's really what they care about. Um, and so we'll correlate like when a bot was involved, what the satisfaction of that conversation was, when it wasn't, when it was partially involved, et cetera. We're looking at all those metrics and it doesn't really make a difference. Um, so I don't think people mind when they are talking to a bot as long as there's a way to get out quickly and they know it. Uh, if those two things are true, then you're probably fine. If not, we've seen people get frustrated. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about the ongoing training mechanism of the bots because uh, when you have this feedback system from the clients and then if they're both make a mistake and the client like the answer but it's actually the wrong answer and then this is recorded on the mechanism. Do you have any mechanism to stop yeah. this misleading answers uh, coming from the bot? Yeah, so um, I sort of alluded to this before but that's that's we call it like human in line. Um, you have to have a human element in all of these, uh, like Watson included, right? Um, no system is perfect yet, and no system will clarify something like that. So if your confidence interval is high and the satisfaction is low, we can actually look in the data and flag those kind of responses and, and dig into them and figure out what was going on and actually give the model like the right output. Um, but there's absolutely still a human element to it, and we have to you know, look at a bunch of conversations and give them the yes or no or right or wrong to, to sort of indicate to the model. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. We're out of time, folks. Yeah. But.